The next work that we will be reading in our class is Afra Ben's Orinoco. Ben published Orinoco in 1688, and as I mentioned in class, Orinoco is a first-person narrative told by a British woman in the West Indian colony of Suriname, and it's set in the mid-1600s. Within this narrative, we hear about two groups in addition to the British, the natives of Suriname, who the narrator refers to as Indians, and Africans brought to work as slaves in the colony. Orinoco, the title character, is one of these African slaves. In addition to being a fascinating story, the reason that we are reading Orinoco in this class is because it provides an excellent example in the development of the novel genre in English. So who is Afra Ben? Well, it seems that she was born in 1640 and then she died in 1689. And what makes her so notable is that she was the first woman writer to make a living solely by her writing. For this reason, she looms large as an important founding figure for women's writing and an important figure to cover in our class. Afra Ben wrote a number of works during her lifetime. For instance, she wrote 18 plays, which made her the most prolific dramatist of the late 17th century in England. In addition to plays, she also wrote prose works like Orinoco and Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister, both of which we would refer to as amatory fictions, which is another way of saying early novels and is something I'll talk about more later in this presentation. In addition to plays and prose works, Ben also wrote poetry. Little is known for certain about Afra Ben's origins or early life. In fact, what she tells us in the beginning of Orinoco is one of our few sources of information about her early life. And it's safe to say that much of Orinoco is probably autobiographical. Some things we do know, though, is that Ben was a female colonist in Suriname, which was an English colony in South America in which Orinoco is set. On the map here, you can see it in red up at the top of South America. In addition to being an English colonist, she also acted as a spy for the Royalists before and after the Restoration. To help you understand what I mean by the Restoration and for whom she was spying, let me give you a little context. In 1649, Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans revolted, revolted, and they executed the King of England, Charles I. The ensuing 11 years are known as the Interregnum, which just means the time between kings. During this time, a Republican parliamentary government known as the Commonwealth ran Britain under Oliver, Oliver Cromwell, rather than there being a monarch. In 1660, though, uh, the restoration was ushered in. Basically what this means is it was the restoration of the monarch. In this case, Charles II, who was the son of the executed Charles I. This group, the, the royalists, those who supported having a monarch in power, were the ones for whom Ben served as a spy. Ben had her greatest success as a writer during the restoration period. And it's perhaps for this reason that her writing often embraces the aristocratic values of the king and nobility. One place where we can see this happening in Orinoco is the fact that she really focuses on how Orinoco was a king in Africa before he was transported to the colonies as a slave. Orinoco is a particularly rich text, and it's a great story, which is why we're reading it. But it also touches on some weighty issues that I want you to keep in mind as you're reading and that we will discuss in class. These issues include race, gender, colonialism, and slavery. One of the questions that I'll want you to really think about as you're reading is whether or not Orinoco is an anti-slavery novel. To better help you to weigh in on this question of whether the, novella, the novel Orinoco is anti-slavery or not, let me give you a little bit of background on the British slave trade. It's important to know that the British Empire really started to spread across the globe during Elizabeth I's reign from 1533 to 1603. 
This spread did not slow down after Elizabeth, though, and in fact, the empire continued to spread under the Stuarts and Cromwell and well into the 19th century. During the period of time after Elizabeth, the empire became even more mercantile and related to trade. To show you the spread of the British Empire, I've included a picture here that you can see. It's an image that shows the spread of the British Empire across the globe by the mid-19th century. Although it had not spread quite this far during the period that we'll be discussing, I think it's helpful to see how far it would spread and the impulses that are controlling the spread here. So if you look at the image, you'll see the spots marked in red. Those are all of the places on the globe that had become part of the British Empire by the mid-19th century. So, how is the slave trade part of this? Well, what would happen is this. Trading ships would sail from Europe to West Africa with a cargo of manufactured goods. They would trade these goods for slaves. Then, they would bring these slaves to the colonies to work on plantations where they would cultivate things like sugar and tobacco. After dropping the slaves off, they would exchange them for items meant for consumption or use back in Europe. The picture on the top of this slide shows you the sort of triangle of trade that was created during this British slave trade. And the bottom picture shows you a representation of slaves being put into a slave ship. It's important to keep in mind that slavery was in full swing at the point at which Aphra Ben is writing her narrative. In fact, the British slave trade wasn't abolished by an act of parliament until 1807, and slavery itself still existed in British colonies until 1838. Some have calculated that British ships carried 3.4 million or more enslaved Africans to the Americas. So this was certainly a topic that people were aware of at the time, and one which we will discuss when we're talking about Orinoco. In addition to reflecting on these weighty issues, it's also an important work for understanding 18th century literature. The reason for including Ben's work in our syllabus is that it provides a short, page-turning example of how fiction would change over the course of the 18th century in England. Specifically, we're going to see the beginnings of a new kind of writing that we take for granted, namely the novel. And just as a side note, it can be a little confusing to people when I talk about this work as part of the 18th century since it was published in 1688. But it's important to know that many historians refer to something called the long 18th century, which was a period of time that lasted from 1688 to 1850 or 1830, depending upon who you're asking. I'm not going to get into a lot of details about how this period of the long 18th century was um, defined, but if you have more questions, feel free to ask me in class. So. Let's talk more about how we can see Orinoco as being part of this transition, this movement towards the novel. While long prose fictions have existed since the origins of writing, and we've read some of them in this class, the novel genre is considered by many literary historians to have first come about in English during the 18th century. Long prose fictions previous to this time were usually romances. For example, Mort d'Arthur. So what were the differences between the novel versus the romance? So as you know, romances were stories of love and adventure written by members of the aristocracy, the upper class of society. And these tales exemplified the values of this upper class. The novel was different though, and in fact its very name emphasizes its newness. So novels are of course long prose fictions, but they are fictions that catered to a new readership. The growing number of middle class, as we would call them, men, and especially women. These consumers were literate, had excess money for purchasing books, and they wanted to read. But they didn't want to read about how great the aristocracy was. They wanted to read fiction that glorified themselves and their values. <laughs> 
and that's part of what shaped the novel as we know it. Here are some of the features that are generally attributed to the novel as a genre, as distinct from a romance, for instance. First of all, novels are frequently about common people, and in general, common people are shown in a positive light, something we certainly didn't see in things like The Tale of Sir Gareth, where there was a much more negative light shown on common people. Secondly, novels are distinguished from romances by their use of realistic detail, something you'll want to pay attention for in Orinoco. They're also interested in specific details and the stories of the individual, rather than general and more timeless truths, which romances often end up focusing on. They're also written in straightforward language, easily read by the middle class readership of the time that was literate but had not received the formal education in Latin and the classics that the members of the aristocracy had. Finally, they're usually about modern life, unlike the misty past that we usually get in romances. What I want you to think about is I want you to think about Orinoco as a transitional form, something called amatory fiction. So in what I've just been describing, I've tried to make the line between what a romance was and what a novel was clear cut. But, in fact, the line between the romance form and the novel form was not as clear-cut as I've been suggesting. For example, extremely popular fiction by women known as romances during the late 17th and 18th centuries, what's called amatory fictions by contemporary scholars to distinguish it from the earlier romance form, these works were interested in love, just as previous romances were. However, and this is where we begin to see the transition, they often did this quite differently than the romances that had pre preceded them. Some described feminine desire that bordered by 18th century standards on the pornographic. <laughs> Some emphasized the power of women, and others were implicitly political. Orinoco is a great example of this transitional form between romance and the novel, and that's why we're reading it, so that we can see the movement from some of what we've read earlier to what we are going to be ending with um, in this course. So as you read, you'll want to pay attention to how it is similar to things like Morta Arthur and what distinguishes it and makes it different.